But yeah, and so back to that night of getting drafted, it was all, I mean, it was amazing as you could think it was. And then uh, there's about a two week time period that there was a little bit of a lull, like we were figuring things out, uh, figuring out, they call it signing bonus and your contract a little bit or whatever. So there was a two week lull. And then I went on to Bristol, Tennessee slash Virginia. And it's called that because it's literally on the state line. And uh, there's actually, uh, never went there, but there's a bar called the State Line Bar. That was down there. <laughs> but uh, it's also where, if anybody's a NASCAR fan, that's where the Bristol race is. And while we were there, you know, that was my first, I, not culture shock, but uh, getting introduced from people of other countries, cultures, backgrounds. Uh, which was another thing, kind of driving up. You, these stories kind of start like this, but like driving up and walking up and seeing the team out there or whatever, you're just like, what am I doing here? Like just being simple-minded, just playing baseball, but it's also like questioning, like what are you doing here? You know, type of deal. I'm in this, I'm in middle of nowhere, which I'm used to, nothing wrong with that. But, uh, and I'm, about to walk into a group of people I've never met, but don't know where they're from. Everybody's from different countries and stuff like that. But uh, it ended up being a great experience. Uh, one guy that I'll talk about a lot will be Hector Santiago. He is a uh, he's on that team, and from this point on, he's on every team that I was uh, as we went up the ranks of the minor leagues. Uh, but he is from New Jersey. He has a, a Puerto Rican background, Puerto Rican family. Uh, but he's still to this day, I was just texting him this morning, he's the best friend. I was the best man in his wedding, which you'll learn too that baseball takes you to different places and we got to go to Puerto Rico again for that, for his wedding. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I go to Bristol and I don't know how many baseball fans are, manager that year is Bobby Thigpen, yeah, who had the single season saves record until uh, K-Rod broke it while we were there, I mean, it might have been 2007. Because he was, yeah, it was while we were there, 2007, it got broken because he was getting a lot of calls and he was getting tired of answering those calls about his record being broken or whatever. Uh, uh, Jerry Hairston was another guy. He's a, a, a big time DH back in his heyday. Uh, but yeah, meeting guys from Dominican Republic, Venezuela, obviously Puerto Rico, uh, all across our country. Uh, Bristol was in the Appalachian League, so I got to start seeing these. At that point, it's called rookie ball, so they're usually in smaller cities like Bristol. Uh, uh, Danville Braves, I'm trying to think. Uh, Virginia, West Virginia teams, all obviously all around the Appalachian Mountains there. Uh, and that was a little bit of a shock too, because they, at that point, you're getting paid to play baseball, and they want you to be good at baseball. And so that is where the strength and conditioning really came in. And I remember thinking to myself, they did everything before games. It wasn't after games. They did everything before the game. And we ran, we lifted, and after that day one, I was like, I'm supposed to throw after this? Like, how? Like, I, I was sitting there, and I, we ran these things called ladders, which is a just big suicide across the, across the outfield uh, warning track. We had to do four of them. I literally, I'm just like, I'm like jelly leg, and I'm supposed to be like pitching later, and I'm like, there's no chance. And so that was another kind of clicked in my head. I was like, all right, this is for real. Like, this is about baseball and baseball only. And so, uh, the rookie year, I mean, it went okay. It wasn't the best. I had a four or five ERA. Uh, they built me up to be a starter. My second year in 2008. Uh, our spring training was in Tucson, Arizona that year, which so flying across the country again is a little bit of a shock doing it all on your own. Once you're out there, you're again, I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, it's just, I'm by myself, another random group of people that I'm supposed to hang out with. But uh, it ends up, everything works out. Like, they're, everyone's in that same position. They got uprooted from their homes and are expecting to do the same thing, which is just play baseball. Uh, and so 2008, I was in Kannapolis, the Kannapolis Intimidators. And if NASCAR fans, uh, 
the Baylor Clark had a stake in this team, and that's why they're called the Intimidators. That's why his nickname was the Intimidator, which I grew up an NASCAR fan, so I was like, wow. <laughs> so, uh, and I want to back up one, just one more time to Bristol. They have a race in Bristol at the Speedway. Usually, they are smart enough that either we're away or we, that's what, usually what the choice was. We were just playing away on the days of the races or whatever. We had an off day on the night of the Bush race, which is kind of like the minor league race, I would say. And there's a group of about five, six, seven of us that got to go. And it was awesome. It was, I've never been that close to the, the those race cars before in uh, Bristol, you're on top of it. So you're smelling the rubber, you're smelling the gas fumes and everything. And it was awesome. And I could see why they made sure that they were playing away. Because we had, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We didn't get any trouble on the field, but we had a lot of fun going to those races. And so Kannapolis is right next to uh, Charlotte. It's only about an hour away from Charlotte. And so we actually got to go to the Charlotte Motor Speedway during those times too. And I'm mentioning those things because if it wasn't for baseball, I wouldn't be in those cities. I wouldn't be in those opportunities. And I wouldn't be in those small towns. So I never, I never went to sleep on the buses. I always stayed awake. And that made for some long mornings and the next days or whatever. Because in the Sally League, we, all, we ran all the way down to Char Charleston, South Carolina all the way up to uh, Wellington, Delaware. And so we had some 10, 12 hour bus rides. And when they talk about, if you ever hear about the minor leagues being a grind, that's the grind part of it. You're supposed to travel through the nine, 10, 12 hours and then get up and play. And a lot of people don't know, we play every day. Uh, in the minor leagues, another reason why it's a grind, I believe they had less, or we had less days off. So throughout a month, I'm guessing maybe two, three days off. And so uh, we're playing just about every every day. And our schedule, and it doesn't change from the big leagues, our schedule would be get there around lunchtime. Uh, minor leagues was a toss up if they had lunch or whatever, you kind of lunch on your own. But you'd go in, you would lift, get all your workout in, you'd uh, take batting practice, and if there's any like pitchers, probably PSP, pitchers building practice, we would do that. We would run after batting practice, come in, eat, uh, post batting practice meal, and we'd shower up, get ready for the games, and we'd play until uh, 10, 10.30 at night, and be home at 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock, uh, depending on how long the games went. We had one game to win the extra innings, uh, 21 innings we played and so that was that was a rough one uh, but yeah so in Kannapolis uh, got to go to Charlotte Motor Speedway and got to see all these small towns and like I said I never went to sleep on a bus because I've never been to these places and I, you know I, I was excited about it I wanted to be remember it and tell everybody right now about it you know so my net that was uh, low A in the Sally League with the Intimidators. My next stop would be in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and that would be uh, High A. My first year when I got called up, I got called up for the playoffs, they were the Winston-Salem War Warthogs. And so that was kind of cool. That was the last year that they were that. The next year, they were supposed to have a new stadium, but they didn't. Uh, we played at Wake Forest University. So when they were at home, we had to be on the road. And so that in the beginning of the season, that meant two, two and a half, three weeks on the road, which is a long time. That's kind of unheard of in the minor leagues. You at least, you just, most of you have is maybe 10 days on the road and then you'd be back home. They became the uh, Winston-Salem Dash. And so I was there a couple weeks, 08, most of 2009, 2010 is when they got the ballpark. Uh, and so that was kind of cool. Got to open up the ballpark there, uh, and I was there all 2010 as well. 2010, I was a starter, and through those years, I was still just kind of average. When I was a reliever, uh, I loved doing that because it fit my mindset a little bit better. About just 100% all the time, I didn't have to hold anything back to try to go six, seven innings. 
or whatever. And that's where it, that part of the baseball game started to develop for me, what I like to do and didn't like to do. It wasn't no longer just, I'll do anything. I was like, man, I really like to read, and it kind of suits me well. So uh, when I was with Canapolis, and the reason, probably the reason I got called up in 2009 towards the end, I got hurt in Canapolis. So Canapolis is my first full year going to uh, the whole the whole process of spring training and however many games we played, I can't even remember now, uh, during the season. And so I was a starter. So every fifth day I was starting, that was routine. You had a day one routine, two routine, three routine, four routine, and your fifth day was your start day. And so I was not prepared for that. And so I ended up getting hurt. My shoulder, I had a shoulder strain. I was on the disabled list for a month and a half. And that's really where I learned a lot about taking care of your shoulder and like what happens when you take care of your body. Because that's when I started coming back throwing 9700. And that's the reason I got called up for the playoffs for Winston-Salem, because I started throwing harder. And at that point, you know, getting a little bit better with my mechanics. I still didn't throw strikes all the time, but I was throwing more strikes than not, I guess. And uh, that's, I guess, 2009. I was a, a reliever because they kind of asked me, and I was like, man, I like relieving. 2010, they wanted to develop a change up for me, so they moved me back to being a starter. Uh, Bobby Thickman, I mentioned earlier, is now our pitching coach at Winston Salem, and I was average at best. I might have had a five or a six ERA starting, and about halfway through the year, uh, he's a big sinker guy, the true sinker, fastball sinker guy. And he knew, like we'd practice one or whatever, he knew it was good. And so he'd just say, hey, one day he's like, hey, next game throw all two seamers. And I'm like, all right, I can do that. Because I like throwing two seamers because I threw mine with the seams. And it's weird that I do not have baseball. But uh, I threw mine with the seams. We got eight. There we go. We got a toss up here. Thank you. So I threw mine, he threw his across the seams like that. And to me, I don't know what I was doing, too much pressure, but I'd always get blisters. I got one right now, actually. I always get blisters off of this finger. I just hurt my finger pushing down on it. So I went with the seam, so I had no seam to tear my fingers up with. After that game, that game, I think, was the longest start I had. Seven and a third innings, no runs, and I'm like, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Because at this point, you know, I, I, it's been three, four seasons in, and I'm like, why didn't I do this a long time ago? And they pulled me in the office, they're like, Nate, we thought, because uh, usually if the ball's moving, it's going to go slower than just the forcing going straight. And so uh, they thought, they were like, man, Nate, we thought your velo was going to go down, but they're like, man, you talked to 97. And in 97, as a starter, it's pretty, pretty dang good. And so that was another kind of turning point where things were starting to click a little bit. Uh, so I did that the rest of the year, ended up being pretty decent. And going into my next year, that's uh, when they put me on a 40 man roster. So at that point, that's when you start getting paid a little bit. I think uh, first man, 40 man back of the van was like, 32,000, if I'm not mistaken. And before that, uh, another funny story, we'd be in three bedroom apartments. Before that, we'd be in three bedroom apartments with like five or six guys in it. We'd have one, uh, there would always be a master closet. We'd have one in the master closet, one in the living room, and then in the apartments, they'd leave you a space for the dining room. The guy would curtain off and be in the dining room. And that's literally, I mean, you know, no joke. And I think less than a month ago, uh, a bunch of minor, minor league guys got together and they won their civil suit against MLB saying they were getting paid below minimum wage uh, for all the hours and stuff that we were putting in and the pay that we received. So literally, those early years, I mean, we had to do that in order to get by and we'd be coming home in the off season with no money. So in the, in the fall, winter, like, and this is part of growing up here too, be, uh, Helping cut tobacco, be stripping tobacco, be working in hay. Uh, I ha I worked at uh, a big rig junkyard down there in Wilder, brake truck and used parts. Uh, I, I, I worked at a horse farm. Like 
worked anywhere he could. Uh, when me and Lacey got married in Lexington, she was still going to pharmacy school. Uh, I worked at a construction job down there. I remember our base job was at the VA hospital. They had this wrought iron black metal fence that we had to take down, sandblast, and hand paint. Not with rollers, like literally dipping your hand in paint and just going up and down the bars or whatever. And so if you see that fence, I think it's still there around the VA hospital in Lexington. I was part of that. <laughs> but so we always, you know, we were always, we were, that's part of the grind too, I guess you'd say. We were always grinding back then just to make, uh, make ends meet and stuff like that. And I say all that to get to this. When we got on the 40 man roster, that's the first time I came home with a little bit of money. And I remember we were moving, uh, uh, moving into the apartments, I think it was in Lexington. And I had bought a couch off one of the guys. He didn't want to take the couch home at the end of the season. I had a big truck. I was like, I'll take it off your hands. Uh, one of the guys, I had bought a TV for our apartment, Hector. Uh, for fun, you know, we, we're all together all the time. So we shoot ski as well. He had bought guns. Didn't want to take the guns from New Jersey. I traded in the TV for like two guns, whatever. I thought it was an awesome deal. So we do stuff like that all the time. And, uh, but yeah, so at the end of 2012 would have been, was my first year. So at the end of 2012 was my first year actually coming home with just a little bit of money, and which we were, we were pumped about. Uh, so that year, along that theme, uh, out of 2012, I was in AA in Birmingham, uh, in Birmingham Barons. And so that was a good year uh, just for my baseball career and mentally with my confidence. Uh, I was getting first month of the year, first two months, month and a half, I was getting hammered. I was just getting crushed. And you know, I'm, again, just simple on me, I'm like, I got that feeling again, like what am I doing here? I don't really belong here. I'm getting crushed, why am I out here? Uh, we had a, a great coach by the name of J.R. Purdue. He served our country for four years. Uh, and so you can kind of imagine his style uh, was kind of strict with us. And it was uh, a ride, a bus ride home from Jacksonville, Florida. So that was in the Southern League. And uh, the Southern League, that was the first league that I didn't have to wear a coat or long sleeves at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year because we'd start the first of April and end in September. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. But that is also the hottest I have ever been in Jackson, Tennessee. I literally thought I was cooking from the inside out. It had been 110 plus. And we're out in the bullpen and it was concrete on both, on the backs and the sides of us and that concrete seating up. And you know, it literally, we thought we were dying. We actually had, we had to play a double header we had our first starting pitcher and he had to go to the hospital. It's not funny, but it is. He had to go to the hospital because he's crushing water, crushing water, but he wasn't doing any uh, salt intake with that. And so every, all the fluids was just like kind of leaving him instead of staying in with him. And he's getting like a full body cramp. Like he literally, I didn't, I've never seen anything like it. Like it literally a full body cramp. He couldn't move anything because he was cramped up and they had to take him to the hospital for that. And one of the guys on the other team, he kind of passed out uh, while he was, up at that. Uh, so I'm not just telling stories, you know, it was the hottest I've ever been in my life. Uh, but Birmingham, our fishing coach, we're on the way back from Jacksonville, Florida. And that, this is, I think, what really turned it around for me mentally. Uh, you know, I, I was struggling, like I said, I could have had a five, six ERA, and I was a reliever, because going into that, they asked me, again, like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to relieve. They ask why, because this is you know, a big turning point. You're a double A, you're fa facing the best of the best prospects and all that stuff at this point. I told them how it suited me well. I love throwing hard. I don't like holding anything back. Let me go one, two innings, and I love that. And so I was getting crushed, and he told me, you know, there's five types of pitchers. Uh, he said five, I might not remember all five, but there's a power pitcher, there's a guy that is finesse, meaning he's got every pitch in his arsenal and he's, he can throw them for strikes. He, he kind of has to throw them for strikes to get guys to chase them. There's a corner guy. There's a guy that lives on the corner of the plate and off, never comes over the middle. 
uh, and then he called funky guys, guys that threw sidearm and stuff like that. Stuff uh, like pitchers and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, funky guys. And he was telling me, Nate, he said, you're a power pitcher. He said, you're a power pitcher until somebody gets on. He said, then you change who you are. You try to be the guy that has to nitpick, and then you walk another guy or give up another hit or whatever. He said, I don't care if you walk guys. And this, I tell guys this all the time. He said, I don't care if you walk guys, but look at uh, Roger Clemens. Go look at Nolan Ryan. Look at guys they walked. I said, but, and he was like, what happens to the guys they walk? And of course, I'm like, I don't know. He's like, they didn't let them score. He said, if you walk guys, I don't care. He said, just don't let them score. He said, don't change who you are. Still be that power guy. And from that point on, like I said, it probably lasted about a month, month and a half where I got killed. And from that point on, I probably had like a one ERA. Because it just boosted my confidence that he was on my side. He didn't care if I walked guys or gave up hits. Just don't let them score. And that made it so, again, simple-minded. It made it so simple to me. I'm like, all right, that's awesome. And so I, I ended up with a two or three ERA on the year. And that speaks on how high it was before I was throwing the one ERA. Uh, again, Hector, I touched on him a lot. Uh, he was on that team as well, and he was a starter. And one day as a starter, your job is to do charts behind the thing. And one of those charts is the radar gun. And I remember uh, at that point I was throwing eighth, ninth inning, and uh, I'd given up a run. I can't remember if we lost or not, but we're back in the, the locker room. Uh, and he comes up, he's hitting me, he's like, Nate, man, that was awesome. I was like, bro, I was like, and I just gave him a run. I can't remember if we lost or whatever. He's like, no, 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 look. And he shows me a chart. I threw 102, and <laughs> he tells me a story uh, that uh, all the time when he's back there and whatever. He sees it, and the, there's always scouts at every minor league game. There's other scouts, team scout, your guys, case of trades, all that kind of stuff. He made sure. He told me he made sure. He's like, "Oh, you guys got that? You guys got that?" <laughs> Make sure I threw 102 or whatever. So you know, Hector is the man, and it leads into me going. Uh, in the 2011 winter into the 2012. They gave me the choice of playing in the Arizona League, which is like a prospect league, uh, over that winter. And like I said, it's kind of like a prospect league, but you didn't really get paid much. You know, living in Arizona is a little bit higher expensive, and so what you pay had to go into your rent or whatever, or I could play winter ball. And winter ball, uh, especially over in Dominican and Venezuela, they're like, hey, good. They can have, thanks it's like six uh, non-native guys, so like six American guys on each team. And Hector played winter ball every off season or whatever. And he was considered a native guy because of his roots or whatever, his family there. And so uh, I was like, all right. I could either make money or not make money. And at, at that point, I wanted to, I still needed to make money. And so I chose winter ball. And that was an experience. Uh, Lacey was in her, they called them rounds of pharmacy school, where each month she was coming out of a different job. And they got one month off. And that month happened to be when I was playing winter ball in December of 2011. So that was awesome. She got to come down. Uh, I actually went down the end of October, 1st of November, so I was there a month without her, she was there a whole month, and then the 1st of January is when I ended up leaving there. So I think that experience helped me a lot, again, culturally, like just being part of something different. Uh, it, was, it, it was fun. He showed us around the island, we went to beaches we never would have gone before. Uh, we went on this zip line, uh, the second longest zip line in the world, and you fly it like Superman. Like you're not sitting, like sitting, you're face down like Superman flying across this thing. You're going about, you know, it feels like 50, 60 mile an hour. And a little story, Lacey, she was like freaking out on our first one because it's like a trail. You'd hike up, get on one, go across the mountain, hike down, go to another one, come back. Uh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And you're on the platform and she's going first. And then I was like, come on, let's just go. And she finally went, and then I got up there, and I'm like, oh, uh, now I know what she's talking about. I'm like, I was like, oh. But ended up uh, having just cool experiences like that that we, I never would have been a part of if it went for baseball. Uh, but some awards, like the, that year in 2011, the most valuable pitcher for the Birmingham Bears. Uh, 
I got that because of that talk that I talked about with our pitching coach. 2010, this is the hardest worker award for our team for Winston-Salem. Our strength and conditioning coordinator that oversees the minor leagues was a professional wrestler. Uh, guys that uh, little baseball nuts, uh, Jeff Torberg, he was the manager for the Yankees a little bit. His son is Dale Torberg, and he made it to AAA, and that's who uh, got, was able to get these. Uh, he was, he wrestled under the name The Demon. <laughs> and so that was his nickname too, Demon. We wouldn't even call him Dale or nothing, we just call him Demon. And uh, he was the, his little story was, he was the offspring, the evil offspring of the band like Kiss. Kiss was big back in the day. So he had to face paint like Steam and all those. I think they even kind of wrestled together with tag team partners at one point. So he had the big spikes and he had face paint. Uh, and his, one of his moves was like the demon chop. And so in the minor leagues, obviously we do a little bit crazy stuff. If you got in trouble or like you know, back talking him or whatever, you'd have to take your shirt off and get the demon chop or whatever. And so then I'm talking, his hand would like, it's just a big slap basically, boom, across yeah. here. And that handprint would be on that dude the rest of the day. <laughs> And, was, and, and so, you know, he was kind of intimidating a little bit, but he was a, he was a teddy bear also. But, uh, yes, yeah, so those are just kind of some of the stops along the way. A couple of things that I have gotten uh, throughout the minor range. And I know I'm rambling on a little bit, I'm sorry. But uh, I guess there's a lot I'm trying to share with you all just to give you an insight of what I had to go through and do. But that is the, the minor leagues I got to play in a couple of playoffs with the, the Warthog and the Dash, we never won the championship. With the Dash, we made it to the championship game. With the Birmingham Barons, we made it to the championship game. One thing I do wish, I wish maybe I would pay attention more to the other team and who I was playing. Uh, just to, like I played against Eric Hosmer, who's with the San Diego Padres. He was with the Royals for a long time. Uh, and one of his other guys, I think Danny Duffy was on that team. They were the ones up in Delaware, Wilmington. Uh, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but like names like Trevor Bauer, when he first got to the minor leagues. He was on uh, Mobile, Alabama. His first game was uh, like the second to last week of our season, and we faced him again during the playoffs that year with Birmingham. Uh, they had a really good team. They had Wade Miley. It's another name. Oh, yeah. He's pitching for the Cubs right now. Uh, Adam Eaton. He's been an outfielder. He was on that team. Their, their starting rotation that year, actually all five of them were uh, made it to the big leagues. And so that was a obviously cool experience. Like I said, I wish I just would have paid attention more to that kind of stuff. I think out of my draft class of the White Sox, our first rounder made it for a month or two or three at the most, and I think that was about it. I'm not saying our draft was a bad year because obviously I was part of it. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, does anybody have any questions about the minor leagues? Oh, we go. Yeah. Can Oh yeah. So, yeah. So these are real belts. So these they kind of mess uh, dress them up a little bit or whatever. Uh, but there's like the hardest worker award for pitcher and position player. And there's like an overall one. And uh, mine is the United States champion. There's an intercontinental champion. There's, uh, I forget which one it is, like John Cena has it a lot at spin. Yeah. That's the overall, like minor league, hardest worker gets that one. Like they're real belts, uh, which is pretty cool that he is able to do that and did that for us. No, I'm not going <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like your upbringing here um, helped you out with minor league ball because it's not as glamorous I, oh, as I think people it yeah. is? And do you think your upbringing here helped you with that? Because I'm sure people struggle with it too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it helped out a ton just, just being uh, show, social, I guess. Like uh, just being humble down there, willing to talk to people because. 
kind of realizing they're doing the same stuff that I'm doing, being pulled away from family or what I'm used to, uh, and being resourceful. Like I said, we had to kind of grind. We didn't have money when we got coming home. We had to have five, six guys in a, in a room or an apartment just to kind of get by and stuff. And I think it, I think it helped out a ton. And I'm, you know, I'm glad for my upbringing and raising because, like I said, I kept my eyes wide open on all our trips, just trying to take it all in. And like I said, seeing stuff I would have never seen if I hadn't played baseball. So yeah, I'm definitely thankful for that for sure. Yes, um, did you ever um, get sad about leaving your family? Oh, yeah, that's a great question, yes. Uh, she's asking if I ever got sad about leaving my family. I think that was the toughest part. A lot of guys, seeing some guys get homesick and stuff like that, and I feel for those guys coming from other countries, just a whole different culture shock. In, my, in Bristol, uh, there's a guy from Korea. We had to give him a translator and everything, so it's a whole different world from over there in Korea and then coming to Bristol. But yeah, I'd say it, that was one of the toughest parts that we was leaving family. I, and that's why we're here now, because of our family and our upbringing and setting roots here. Is there any other? Yep. So, so I'm also a big fan of boxing too. Mm -hmm. So did you watch any of that when you were in other countries? Because I know that when you go to countries like Venezuela and Puerto Rico, that's more popular yeah. than baseball. Uh, when I was... You know, I tend to didn't go out at night too much when I was in other countries, except when I was with Hector or whatever. And, uh, you know, when I was in Puerto Rico, like, it was, I don't remember watching other sports as much. I played for the Indios de Maya Wes. And the year that I played with them, uh, which was cool. It's weird how this works out. Like, they're on the, the countryside, the far, East, no, that'd be west. Far western side of the island, I think it was. And all the other teams were in the north of San Juan, and there's one over in the east. Uh, but it was like in the countryside, and so we find these, we find these little cafes or uh, pastry shops. That's what it's called, a pastry shop. It just looks like a house, someone's house. It probably was someone's house. And he just like, and my buddy Hector. I'm like, dude, this looks like him calling me. This looks like somebody's house. And no, I promise you, walk in and they. I mean, they got the roll black uh, glass and all the pastries there and stuff like that. Uh, I don't remember watching too many other sports. Like, it was all just everybody hanging out, dancing. Obviously, in the Latin cultures, they love to dance. And so there was a lot. Obviously, I wasn't dancing, but I was watching other people dance <laughs> and stuff. So it was, uh, we had a good time, for sure. Makes you appreciate the next step, the, the big ones, for sure. But was there any other questions about the minor league ground? Yeah. When you were a kid, oh, who was your favorite basketball player? Basketball player, uh, Akeem Olajuwon. When they, I kind of stopped watching basketball nowadays, but that was the one time during an all-star game, the basketball's all-star game, that our parents would let us eat in the living room so we could watch it. Michael Jordan, Akeem Olajuwon, Charles Barkley, Shaq, uh, those type of guys. 